Well, I, I don't know about you, but I certainly enjoyed the sessions today, especially the one on anxiety this morning. I'm looking forward to the one on depression tomorrow and uh, some of the other things. I'm also looking forward to this evening. I hope that you are as well. I, uh, if you were, weren't able to come out, uh, we had a good time shooting some, some shotguns and we shot some pistols and stuff today, but I have to say I'm not terribly pleased with our speaker because he shot too good. <laughs> no, no, it was, it was a good time this afternoon and uh, a bit tired. I'm sure he's a bit tired. Uh, I'll admit I got a bruise. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Brother Yellen, yes, you come. thank you so much, Pastor Aaron. And thank you. Thanks for letting me go shooting with you guys today. That was really fun. And uh, I haven't got to do proper skeet shooting in a while, so it was, it was fantastic. Um, tonight, we are talking about the heart in the form of righteousness. So as you know, the theme for this week is tools for the purpose of ministry. And uh, I, I perceive from my experience, and you probably have as well, because this is a very experienced crowd, that um, we are under under attack, as the Bible has told us, from wolves in sheep's clothing. So this is a problem. And as people who are looking to lead our flocks, and those of us who are also here looking to be a flock led well and not led into false doctrine and teaching, we want to look tonight at some of those attacks that are coming and the form of those attacks so that we can be prepared to defend them and prepared to help our congregate, meet our congregation's needs and our own needs to keep our hearts focused on God and focused on the doctrine of God's Bible and the truth of His Word. That's important to me. Um, I, I should probably you know, start with full disclosure here. Uh, I, I shared a little bit about this, but both my wife Amanda and I um, come from larger families, uh, and both of us have had a brother who's uh, uh, not necessarily become a, a godless reprobate heretic, but has left from the traditional conservative ways that we would like to see our people and our family and live in. And um, it's not like my brother's lost his salvation or anything. But he's certainly not living and acting in the way he was, he was uh, brought up to be doing. And he was led away by some of these false doctrines from wolves in sheep's clothing. So I care a lot about this topic. I, I might get a little animated tonight. But uh, I, I am very sincere in this because it's very important to me. And I'm incredibly concerned about making sure that these kids that are going out... Uh, going away from home, going to college, I got to overhear a little bit back in the office studying today uh, from the meeting, talking about the fund for uh, the scholarships, and uh, I think that's great that we are, are helping kids get a Christian education, but I want those kids going out to a Christian education to be prepared against these attacks from false doctrines, and they are smart and they are scary. Uh, to me, they are, because it's so easy to be led astray. But if we know what we're looking for, and we know how to fight back rightly with God's word, we can win. And I love to win. So, let's jump into it tonight. The heart and the form of righteousness, a tool for detecting wolves in sheep's clothing. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 and 16. We're going to start there tonight. Uh, start with some Bible reading, because the Bible comes first always. That is God's truth, and that's where we will find our strength. Uh, uh, you know, as you're turning there, every time I've ever been in a college class where uh, they're trying to teach something, and I'm like, yeah, that doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem quite right. I'm going to stick with what the Bible says, even though my professor disagrees with what the Bible says. I come to find out later, when I get a little bit farther along and learn a, bit, a little bit more, that professor was wrong and God's way was right. It's the truth. God's Bible is the word that we can trust and should be first, even above our own knowledge, even above our own thoughts and feelings that we might perceive. We can always trust God's word to be true. And it's also true in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 and 16. So let's go ahead and read that tonight. The Bible says, uh, Beware false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? The answer here is that there are these sheeps, sh sheeps, that boy, I'm not a farmer, am I, apparently, sheeps. <laughs> sheep 
and wolves' clothing. They're out there, and, and we're warned of them in God's word. So, let's take a look at how this works. So, first off, I want to do definitions. Defining words is very important for us as we try to uh, express a biblical scholarship and as we try to advocate for our way because it's so, and I'll show you in a moment on this, but it's so easy to control an idea by controlling the definition of the words. I'm not going to go too deep because I've got more slides on that, but let's start by defining things. What's a wolf in sheep's, sheep's clothing? These are teachers who seem to be good, and they seem to be teaching the truth, but they don't teach the truth. And it's difficult because they do actually seem to be good. They come across as people who are very nice and friendly, and they say things and they use words that sound good. In fact, they might say things that if you interpret it from a correct biblical hermeneutic are good, but they're not interpreting it from that correct biblical hermeneutic. Pastor Aaron, I didn't take preacher classes. What's hermeneutic mean again? Way to study the Bible. Oh, way to study the Bible. Okay, yeah. There I go. Sorry, Amanda, I accidentally used jargon. These guys know stuff. I'm not. But it's a way of studying the Bible. Okay, so the problem we have here with wolves and sheep's clothing is that they're difficult to detect. The Bible tells us the way to detect them, though. God didn't leave us with nothing. He gave us his word so we can fight back. So how do we detect them? By their fruits. So what are they teaching? What are they putting out? What's the material that these wolves in sheep's clothing are putting out? And then what does that material produce? That's, your, that's the Bible answer. And so let's break into that and use that model uh, and go into detail on it tonight with some biblical scholarship so we're armed against that. So um, false teachers use this trick very often so that they can seem to be teaching the truth but they're not teaching the truth. I call this trick derived learning. If you're in my college class, if I ever teach a college class on ABA therapy, we'll call it derived relational responding. But once again, we don't need the jargon. All it is is learning that comes from uh, drawing conclusions. And then if you're using this, you're going to try to get people to draw false conclusions based on the information that you give them. So false teachers are often going to speak truth along with their lies, and they're going to speak from a point of view that the true things they say from their point of view will lead people to draw false conclusions, uh, and we call this derived learning. So I've got some slides to help explain that. Uh, this, and I'm going to step down so I can use the laser pointer on here. If I can figure out how to use it, I probably should have practiced beforehand. Oh, there it is. Okay. So this little squiggle up here is something I drew freehand in PowerPoint. Uh, it means nothing. I just drew it. But I could take a child, I could take Alice or Clara and bring them up here and, and teach them. Okay, this little squiggle, this little squiggle means cat. Okay, it doesn't matter what that squiggle is, I just made it up. But I can say, this squiggle means cat. And a cat is this little thing. By the way, if you're watching, thank you, Lauren. I borrowed this video, from, or this picture from the one you shared at work. We had, a, we had a share your pets thing at work. And then this was Lauren's. It's cute. It was the cutest one, so that's why I made it in the PowerPoint. So Lauren's cat over here. Uh, I've said, okay, this squiggle, that means cat. You all know what ca the word cat means because, well, my daughter's been taught English, so they know the word cat. Squiggle means cat. Cat means this little animal here. It's all really cute. Now, I don't have to teach them if they know that this squiggle means cat and that cat means this animal. I don't have to teach them that this squiggle also means this animal. Even that, that squiggle is literally just something I made up. It has no relation to cat at all. But if I teach them that that squiggle means cat, they, ought, they can derive and learn without anyone needing to teach them and make this connection here, this dotted line, that this squiggle is equal to this cat. Now you might say, that's a little weird. How's that going to teach somebody false doctrine? Because, <laughs> okay, it's kind of not incredibly obvious. But it's false teachers. False teachers are using things that are not incredibly obvious. That's why they're the wolves in sheep's clothing. So, okay, so let me give you an example with an actual false doctrine that's very popular right now. If you're on the campus of Maranatha, Aaron and I were talking about this because we're Maranatha students. We were just talking last night. The teachers there never taught anything like this and would never teach anything like this, but the other kids in the dorms might argue and teach this, and I think that's one of the ways that uh, this corruption is being taught, and there's false teachers, not your, your teachers in your classes in college, but those other kids in the dorm who've grown up with these false doctrines. Okay, so this is a real false doctrine. So we start with something we know to be true. Glorifying God is good. Amen? 
That's right, we should be glorifying God. Okay, so then someone comes along, the false teacher teaches this false doctrine over here. This false doctrine is called Christian hedonism. If you're interested in looking it up, there's a lot written about it. It makes me too mad, so I can't, I'm not going to bring it up and read anything. It makes my blood, blood boil. Well, I should say, that's a movie reference. Anyways, so we can say glorifying God is good, and we know that. And then the teacher says, well, yeah, of course glorifying God is good. This is the truth they present. And then they present the false doctrine. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. So that's the doctrine of Christian hedonism, which is a heresy, as I will prove in one moment. So then what uh, this draws us to conclude, if you believe this heresy, my satisfaction then is good. If I'm satisfied, then that would mean that God is glorified. Okay, so then if glorifying God is good, which it is, and my satisfaction is good, those things are equal, then that means that the way to glorify God is to please myself. That's heresy, okay? That's heresy right there. It's proven in God's word. 2 Timothy 3, 4, and 5 says, Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. That's a godless heresy that's being pushed everywhere right now, and I hope that God gives us the power to crush it utterly. But it's, a, it's, it's something that our kids in Bible colleges right now are dealing with. I guarantee you, even tonight, they're probably discussing it in the dorms. It's everywhere. It's called Christian hedonism. Strongly recommend people look it up. It's a big problem right now. Okay? And it's a derived doctrine. You can have a good kid who's learned good things and knows glorifying God is good and knows that I want to do things that, make, that please God and they can go and hear this doctrine that says God's most satisfied with me or God's most glorified in me when I'm most satisfied with him and they can make it sound good and they put it with truth that is good and someone draws that derived conclusion, I should please myself. And that's how God is glorified. And if God's glorified by pleasing yourself, then why obey him? Because that doesn't make me happy. That's hard work. No, I should just please myself, and then I'll be fine. And I don't have to worry about obeying. I don't have to worry about any of these things. I can just have a good time. It's heresy. It's false. In 2 Timothy, we have it directly and explicitly countered in Scripture, word for word, from such turn away. And so we know that, because the fruits that come from this teaching are wrong. So, like I said, I got riled up. Sorry about that. There's some reasons in my history about why this is important to me, and I, th I think it's probably showing, so I'll try to be a little calm here as we continue. Um, but uh, this idea, uh, I'll go back here, this idea of derived learning is a way that our false teachers, it's a method that they're using to take good people who've learned the right things and convince them to believe things that are not right. And, and with respect to everyone here who's not a pastor tonight, most of the people in your congregation are very unlikely to detect this. Okay, If there's any hope, it's those of us who are learned in God's word that can detect this. And so it is our responsibility to uh, be on the lookout for it and uh, stand against it and help arm our people and protect them against these false doctrines and false teachers and mark them out from among you, as you guys know that verse, so I'm not going to pull it up. All right, So beware of this trick of drive learning. It's very clever. Uh, it uses some very advanced psychological techniques, and I hate it. So, please, <laughs> I hope that's clear. And if you have any questions on that, please ask me afterwards. I'd be happy to explain this in more detail if it will help you fight back against it. So, uh, continuing to the next thing that's used. Uh, you, this technique we might be a little bit more familiar with. It's a little more on the surface. Uh, false teachers will also corrupt our language. We see this a ton in politics, right? The, the change of words and the euphemisms the battle of modern politics, like reproductive rights. <laughs> what a joke. Reproductive rights. Because it sounds good. I think people should have the right to reproduce. That seems pretty much in line with God's word, right? So you call it reproductive rights, and it sounds good. But reproductive rights to people in politics means murdering babies, which is not good. Right. So uh, corrupting the words, we see it in politics all the time. Well, it happens in, our, in uh, 
our theology as well. So false teachers are often going to corrupt the meaning of words in order to corrupt the doctrines that our people are looking to. And if they have a misunderstanding in what the words that we're using mean and what the words in the Bible mean, then they can be led astray into false doctrine. And, and once again, uh, you know, with respect to people who are not pastors in the audience tonight, the people best armed to protect the congregation against this are the pastors, because you guys are the ones who have the time in the, in, this, in the Bible. And if you are involved in studying the languages even, I know Pastor Aaron will, you know, because I'm not a language guy, I didn't study the languages, and sometimes I'll call him up and say, hey, what's the deal with this, this passage? Because it's a little confusing, I want to know what the meaning of this word is. And then he can, he can study it for me. I don't know that you've had Greek either, but I know you've studied the Bible, and so you know, uh, you know some of the context and can look up the Greek for me and explain it. And, and that's been very helpful to me because the definitions are important. And false teachers are going to corrupt the definitions so that they can change the meaning of what the words are. Okay, so here's an example because I don't want to just say it. I want to prove it. Christian duty. So duty... <laughs> Okay, Nikki's going to laugh at me saying duty. It's with a T, D-U-T-Y, Christian duty, is a thing that ha- is a word that has had a corrupted definition. This is very common. In fact, I would say uh, probably 90% of your college kids are looking at the word duty in the new way instead of the old way. The old view of Christian duty is that duty is the choice to deny myself and follow God's way because it's the right thing to do and it pleases Him. It is right to do what is right, even when I don't feel like doing it, because this honors God. This is the, the thing that happens on Sunday morning, after you've been up all Saturday night working on something that you couldn't... One time, Okay, here's my sad story, Pastor Aaron. One night, Mrs. Yelland and I had our, sewer, our septic tank blow. And I don't know what that's like out here, but in Michigan, with the water table where it is... That's a mess. And it was smelly and gross and dark. And we're up all night trying to fix our septic tank so that we didn't have all this backup and ruin our house. Not cool. It's not cool. So if you did that the night before and then that alarm goes off on Sunday morning, you're not jumping out of bed. Yeehaw! I get to go to church this morning. Also, we're not from the South, so nobody's doing that anyways. But... (laughs) (laughs) But, <laughs> yeah, amen. Uh, but uh, but the, uh, the old view is it's the right thing to do for me to say, I don't feel like it, but I'm going to push down the feelings that I have that say I don't want to go to church today, and I'm going to go anyways because I know it's going to please God to obey him. So that's the traditional view of what Christian duty is. But the modern view, the new view on Christian duty, the one that's very, very popular today, most of your college kids, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if we have any college kids represented here in the audience tonight, but if you have some, this is probably what they're used to viewing Christian duty as. Duty is a performative act. It's a performance. So where we follow a standard with no conviction in our heart, and it's wrong because it's legalistic, and it's not accompanied by genuine feelings for God. So, Pastor Aaron, if that was you and you had to fix your septic, which you're on city sewer, so you wouldn't have to do that. But, all right, let's say for some reason you have to stay up Saturday night real late and you don't feel like going into church the next morning. From this view, you shouldn't do it because duty is a bad thing. It would be legalistic for you to go to church because you're not feeling it. And instead, you should f- stay home and try to get your heart right and get those feelings for God in place. And that would be the right thing to do. Because duty is a bad thing now in this new view. You shouldn't have duty. Because if you're doing it out of duty, then you're not doing it with a right heart after God. So it's wrong. And you see, that's obviously false to those of us here who, who are wise and knowledgeable in God's word. That's obviously incorrect. But it's, it's a, a change in definition that's very, very common. And many, many young Christians have accepted this new definition for duty. And, so, and in so doing, have erred in their doctrinal pa- actions. They've erred in their understanding of the faith. Because corrupt teachers and false teachers have changed the meaning of the word. So that's a problem. And once again, we're the ones who have the solution. Because you guys are the ones who know God's word and can be on the lookout for people changing the definitions of these words. And it helps for you in your study to define your words, to know what our words mean. And that can be hard to do and it can be a lot of work, but it's a good study. It's a good use of your, your Bible study time. 
take a passage. What does all of this stuff mean? What do the words here mean? And can I, can I defend that from God's word and know what this means and how it's used? That's a good way. Uh, I almost said a good waste of your time. It's not a waste of your time. It's a good use of your, of your time uh, to know what your words mean. Okay, so definition changes t- doctrine. Um, so before we sacrificed because it was right, now we refuse to act because it was wrong. Doctrine changed because the definition changed. So that's the thing to be aware, be aware of. So watch out for false teachers teaching derived learning, learning through implication that some other thing that they're not directly saying is true. What's the implication of what they're saying, not just what's on the surface? And then the second is changing definitions to change doctrine. Okay, so, uh, oh, and by the way, (laughs) with the Christian duty, I forgot this slide was in here. Uh, The derived doctrine from the Christian duty argument is even worse because it says God only cares about what emotions that you have and that your obedience doesn't matter. That seems like a big problem to me. If you only have to feel the right feelings and uh, your actions don't matter at all, that's a big problem. Big, big problem. Okay, so... Those are the tactics that I see most often from wolves in sheep's clothing in our modern time. So, on the practical, practical component, I want to look at the two key false doctrines that are being pushed right now for our teenagers and young adults. Okay? So, the two key, key doctrines uh, that are attacking churches and children today are, number one, what is the heart? Having the correct definition of the heart is the first one. And the second is the form of righteousness. Okay, so I'll go in and explain these here. And uh, if that's not immediately clear what those mean, then we'll we'll have it by the end of the night. All right, so first, what is the heart? Now, as best I can tell, and once again, many of you have studied the Bible for more years than I've been alive, and that's wonderful. Uh, Well, maybe not. I'm getting old now, Pastor Aaron. (laughs) An old man. It would have been true 20 years ago. Okay, so uh, the, the Bible does not have a dictionary definition for heart. It talks about the heart in a way that it assumes you already know what the heart is. The Bible does this a lot. For instance, there's not really a passage in the Bible that declares, here's the proofs why God is real. Okay, It assumes that you already understand that God is real. Because the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. It's obvious that God is real. Okay, So the Bible doesn't lay out the here's you know all the metaphysics of how God works it just knows that it's obvious so the same is true with the word heart so there's not a clear definition for the heart that makes an opening for our opposition to put in their own definition so um for here here's a verse that I think is useful Proverbs 4 verse 23 keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life this is the closest a decent definition of the heart that I could find in my, my study prep for this, this message. And maybe you know one that I missed. I didn't read through the whole Bible for this one slide. <laughs> but uh, this is a pretty, pretty solid description uh, from the Bible. Keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. Okay, so then what's a traditional definition of the heart? So the traditional conservative understanding of the heart is that it's the deepest part of our being. It's our real selves. Okay, a clear definition is heart, the part of us that selects which action to take when given an opportunity to choose. It's our soul. This is the traditional view of what the heart is. And I, I think it's one that we can all, we're all pretty much, yeah, that's obviously what the heart is. I don't think it's that confusing for anyone. Uh, but our opposition has a different view on this. And they're pushing really, really hard a different definition for this. So the false view is they say the heart is our emotions. It's our feelings. So this is false. The Bible uses the word bowels to refer to the seat of emotions when it talks about internal metaphysics and and, uh, emotional language in the Bible. refers to bowels. Uh, The verse, uh, for example, Philippians 1.8, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Uh, Referring to how uh, emotionally engaged that they were in uh, wanting to uh, see them. Okay, so... With the idea of heart as emotions, this is a big attack, the doctrine of what the heart is. Okay, the, Their goal here by the wolves in sheep's clothing is to confuse the definition so that following God's word about the heart is undermined. Now, because I'm not just going to say stuff like that and not prove it, let's take a look. 
If the heart equals emotions, many Bible verses are interpreted in error and lead to false doctrines. Let's look at some. First one, Proverbs 3, 5. This is the false view. I've labeled it clearly because I don't want to sow any confusion out there. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. So if you take a false view of heart, that heart is emotions, then the conclusion that you must draw the derived learning from that false definition would be, don't understand things. Don't waste your time with your own understanding. Just feel the right feelings about God. Is that a correct doctrine? Absolutely no. But if you believe the heart is the seat of emotions and you read that Bible verse, that's an accurate conclusion to draw. And so the derived learning component will have you derive that you shouldn't be understanding God's word. You should just feel good things about God. And that's heresy. And that's the false view. The correct view of Proverbs 3, 5, would, would, uh, when we look at the heart, is that part of us which chooses and is responsible, our soul. When we look at it with that traditional definition, we understand the true meaning of this text is to trust in God's word instead of your own. And that's what we should do. And that's a clear and correct interpretation of that scripture. But it only comes when we have the correct definition of the heart. So let's do another. I've got three of these. We're going to do all of them, Pastor Aaron, because I'm doing much better on time tonight. So we're going to do all of them. Proverbs 23, 15. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. If you interpret this with heart as your definition, uh, uh, with the heart as the seat of emotions definition, you would interpret this to mean if you feel wise, then God is happy. Which, that goes back to the Christian hedonism problem. We already talked about that. And, And there's a reason why that Christian hedonism has a lot of support today. Because you can do this trick by changing heart. And then it makes a lot of these things fall in line with that false doctrine. The correct interpretation, when we choose wisely, when our heart decides to follow after God and makes the wise decisions, and we know Proverbs talks about, you know, wisdom is the application of knowledge and the knowledge we gain from God's word, that's what we're supposed to be applying. So when we choose wisely and we choose God's way, then God is pleased. That's the correct traditional view of what that verse means. Okay? So when we have the correct definition... Then we have the correct application of the scripture. And when they corrupt our definition, then we don't. So let's keep going. Let's get these definitions right. Make sure that no one's coming in to uh, teach false definitions for our ideas because they can sound right. You can say things that sound good, but you change the definition and no longer is it good. Let's do Proverbs 3.1. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. That means obeying, if you take that false view, obeying God means feeling good about his word. So I don't have to obey it, I just have to feel good about it. And that's how they act. That is literally what they teach, those that support that Christian hedonism idea. That's literally what they teach. Feel good about God's word and that's what really matters. Your actions will just follow because your heart is, is feeling the right thing. And we don't have to worry about that. The true view is that obeying God means following his word. Keep those commandments in your heart. That means choose God's way. When those opportunities come up, in the the morning session we talked about the A, B, C, D, right? When that A comes up, you choose that behavior, that B, that is correct. Regardless of the consequences, C, because the D, the, the delayed thing... That's what matters. That Pleasing God in eternity is what really matters. Okay, so when we understand the correct definition, suddenly the doctrine is correct, and suddenly it's clear. And if they corrupt the definition, then the doctrine is lost, and we lose people away to false teachings. So, the whole point, the doctrine of the heart. We have to have the right definition for the word heart. I think this is probably one of the biggest attacks we've got against the church today as far as attacks in turn inside the Christian realm from the liberal side of the Christian spectrum. And I would include non-Baptist uh, churches in that as well, as, lo- as well as different sects of the Baptist church. Okay, Be very, very careful of anyone coming in with a murky definition of heart or that leans too much into the heart being emotions. Um, some people are just uh, not out of necessarily out of intent could mess this up. I, I'm not saying anyone who ever comes in and talks about heart is 
being emotional is necessarily evil or attempting to corrupt us. But even on accident, if you start to follow that theology, it's going to corrupt your doctrine. So, number one, the doctrine of the heart. We've got to be very careful for it. It's a, a big, big piece of the attacks from wolves in sheep's clothing in our world today. The second one is the form of righteousness. I think it's a weird way to say it, but it sounded good in the title, so I kept the form of righteousness. Okay, the second main attack by wolves in sheep's clothing is to limit the form of righteousness to internal actions. When I say form of righteousness, I mean what, what way do we act righteous? Okay, how do we be righteousness? Through what medium, I guess, that's a weird way to say it too. So this is where I don't have the Christian cliches and I get technological, I'm sorry. But through which medium, which way do we show righteousness in, in, in right actions? So that's under attack as well. So uh, the form of righteousness is a second main area. Now, if you're familiar at all with the idea of trichotomy, this is, uh, I can't remember the verse it comes from. Um, We'll look it up and we'll email it out if everybody wants to know. But uh, the, the Bible talks about us having a body and soul and spirit, okay? So um, in this, this is, uh, I use body, mind, and spirit because this is what I'm familiar with for the terms from my studies. Uh, and lots of different people through the years have used different labels for the three parts. But regardless, it's very consistent that we see three parts to human existence that have part of the form of righteousness. So we have the body, this is our external self, the, the flesh and bones that we have, those external things we can do that can be seen. We have the mind, which is the internal self, those actions that can't be seen, your own thoughts inside. And then we have the spirit, which we talked about at length already, but uh, which is our soul, our heart, that part of which, us which chooses and chooses how we're going to respond to those challenges that come to our life. Okay, so the human trichotomy uh, that we are familiar with, I think, I, I assume most of us are familiar with at least the idea of this. Uh, there's a, uh, Reformed Christians especially, but liberal Christians broadly, have, make a false claim about how this works. And their claim is that the external actions, the things you would do that would be seen by other people, don't matter. Only the internal actions, actions, the, the thoughts that you have, and they will very often uh, say the feelings that you have, which is a whole, very wrong and a whole, it'd take me a whole other, whole other session to cover that, Pastor And so ask me later. Uh, the, the, the internal actions uh, are the only thing that matter. And then because they think your heart is your spirit, then that just means your emotions. So you have to feel good about the internal actions that you're taking. So their false claim about the form of righteousness would be that you are righteous when your internal actions are correct and you feel good about it. That's what their claim is. And that's the liberal view of how righteousness should be done. So they're teaching this, they're pushing this really hard right now. Um, the, no, this next one is less strongly pushed, uh, but there are some churches still. This is uh, more of an 80s thing. This was popular in the 80s. Some in the early 70s, a little bit. It was dying out in the 90s. Um, this is the legalist or hyper-conservative false claim. This would be that only the external actions matter. Only the things that other people can see are what really matters, spiritually speaking. And righteousness is done through the, the actions, the works that you do. And then the internal actions, your thoughts inside, and, and that doesn't really matter all that much. And so uh, for your spirit, you should just make sure that you show your good works and you look good. Uh, this has basically died out. I, I don't think this is very popular anymore, but I know there are still a few churches out there that push this. Uh, so it's worth being aware of. Uh, but real, realistically, the liberal or reformed view is, is very, very strong right now. It's... it's uh, so strong. I mean, I remember some guys in college pushing this that were like, you know, we have soul liberty. So, I mean, I, it doesn't matter if I do that or not. So that's, you know, we can do what we want. You know, if I need to go, if I want to go drink alcohol, like that's, that's fine. As long as I, you know, feel good about that. I mean, that, that's a, a pretty extreme version of it, to be fair. But that's the, if you take their theology to that logical conclusion... They're literally to the point where, you know, 
I can disobey directly what the Bible says, and uh, it's fine as long as I feel that I love God through it. So that's wrong. The correct view, our historical conservative view, the true claim that's based on the Bible and is reasonable and reasoned, is that God sees all, right? What's the verse? We're familiar with it. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God sees the heart, right? Okay, so if that's true, which it is because it's in the Bible, then that means that God sees not only the external actions, but also the internal actions, and both matter. So when that guy pulls out in front of me as I'm driving out here, which nobody did, you're all wonderful drivers in this town, thank you. But uh, when, and that makes me, if, if somebody did do that somehow, probably some out of town are coming in for something, you know. And then uh, <laughs> that's just to pick on everybody else who's here. Uh, but somebody comes in and they're driving badly and that's going to make me mad because, you know, that's what happens. It's a reflex to have that anger triggered. Then I've got to decide how am I going to react? Am I going to forgive and calm myself? and uh, let that go or am I going to roll down the window and yell and throw all the fingers out there and uh, react badly okay so uh, internally I might not throw roll down the window I might not throw the fingers but in my mind I might be thinking oh that little jerk he's such and I might not forgive him all the way to church here the, tomorrow morning and uh, is that the right internal action no it's not because we should forgive people even when they pull out in front of Jonathan Yelland on the way into church also, no one should ever fall in front of me on the way into church. All right. Now, we understand as conservatives, God sees all and he wants all. He's not satisfied with just the works. He's not, or with the external works. He's not just satisfied with the internal works. He wants all of us and he wants us to have a heart, a spirit that will choose to do right no matter what comes. We know that's the, the correct view. And so our opposition is trying to destroy this view, mostly by claiming that the external isn't really the important and only the internal really matters. So, uh, in conclusion, as we're looking to guard the sheep in our flocks, well, your flocks, I'm not a pastor. I just play one on TV. <laughs> please watch Finding the Point. Uh, please look out for these big false teachings. They're going to claim that the heart is your emotions. The heart is not your emotions. It's your soul. It's that part of you which chooses. It's the part of you that decides if you're going to follow God and God's way or not. And then number two, they're making the argument that righteousness is only internal. It's not part of your external behavior at all. It's just the internal. And we know that that's false because God can see all of us and God wants all of us turned towards him. Both our insides and our outsides, the whole of us. So, please watch out. Please be careful. Guard your hearts and guard the churches and guard the other Christians that you have an influence with. Watch out for these false doctrines. And then also watch out for the tricks that they're going to use with corrupting the language and using derived learning where they're going to say something nice but it implies something bad and, and is hard to detect because you've got to project that out. So be careful for those techniques be careful for these big false doctrines that the church is under attack with today. And then as our final challenge before we close here, I challenge everyone here, whether you're a pastor or not, consider your practice. And by practice, I don't mean, you know, practicing. But as you go through your day, all right, as a clinician, I practice, which is probably why I wrote practice in there. But consider your pra the practice of your Christian life. Do you watch out for these wolves in sheep's clothing? And then are you applying your scholarship to watch out for that derived learning? And I would challenge you to take some time tonight, maybe before you go to sleep, and consider, is this something I'm aware of? Is this something I'm watching out for? And maybe make an action plan on how you might make sure that you're prepared for it. Because if we who know what is true and right don't prepare ourselves against the attacks of the enemy, there's not anyone else who will. It is our responsibility, and we can make a difference and we can win, and I challenge you to win tonight. So that's my final challenge. Pastor Aaron, go ahead and uh, close for us, please.